We begin this day with the words of that wise sage Yoda, who tells us the order of, of suffering, right? Fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to the dark side. And it's an order that makes sense, too, if, if you look at it. And this is what I found myself thinking about as I write about the four horsemen of Revelation. They come in a distinct order based upon what each of them mean. As we've been covering Revelation the last weeks, I'll, I'll I will remind you again that uh, when you read Revelation, it's an entirely symbolic book. The colors, the numbers, the beasts, they all, all are all symbols for other things. And so, as we look at the four horsemen, the colors have meanings. The first color of the first horse is the white horse. White is the color of victory. And so, it is the person who is riding and having victory. White is not a moral color. It's not someone's right or wrong. It's just the person who's winning. And the person who is winning at this time are the Roman emperors. And so, the first horse is is the Roman Empire and their emperors riding to victory. And what follows the white horse is the red horse. And red, as you might guess, is the color of blood and bloodshed and strife and war. And so once you start having the white of victory, they keep on going to war. They keep on fighting again and again and again, because once you've had victory once, you get a taste for it and you want to fight again. And so there is continuing bloodshed. This is what the Roman Empire, do, the Roman Empire does again and again. They, they get addicted to it. It is, it is the eventual fate of the Roman Empire that once they run out of foreigners to fight, they turn on each other and Roman legion will fight Roman legion until they are so weakened that they will fall. That's a little bit down the road. But so white victory leads to the red horse of, of bloodshed and strife and it leads to the third horse, the black horse. And black, again, it's not a, white and black are not moral in Revelation. Black simply means absence, the lack. You don't have it. And, and so the rider of the black horse calls out, one uh, quart of grain for one denarius. The denarius is the, the unit of money, like a dollar today. And you can make one denarius in one day's work, and one quart of grain will feed one person for a day. So it sounds about right until you've got to feed a family. And when you work one day and you only make enough to feed one person, and you've got multiple kids and a wife at home, that's famine, right? That's what happens. The, the red of the bloodshed of the war, of the strife, leads to famine because all the people who would work the fields are dead or are off fighting. And, and so there isn't enough food to go around. There's not a crop being brought in. And even more, there is a economic persecution that is happening. Those who follow Jesus or are not willing to sacrifice to say that the Roman emperor is, is God. They would burn a pinch of incense as an act of worship, saying the Roman emperor is God. Uh, they are not allowed to work. To, uh, to shop, to go and buy the grain, even if they could afford it. But the rider of the black horse says, but don't touch the olive oil and the wine. That's the, what the rich people get, right? Don't, don't mess with the rich people, but, but the, those who don't have will not be able to afford to eat. And so victory leads to war, leads to famine. What's the last horse? What's that lead to? Death, right? The pale green color of death. That horrible color of a body that's left sit to rot. And this is not a color we see often, but that is the consequence of war and then famine. The consequence is death. And so after the four horsemen comes the martyrs who cry out, How long, O Lord? And they are told that they will have to wait, but God's will is going to be done. And so if you want to understand hard times, hard times are just like Yoda says. There's an order to them. They unfold in a certain way that eventually leads to its own downfall. But that's, that's the message of the seven seals of Revelation. There is an order to evil. It's a horrible order, but there is an order to it. Hard times are also like this. Let's go on to the next picture. Hard times are like this picture of this baby. Everyone agree? Cute baby, right? If someone walked in with this baby, we'd all pass them around and bounce them on our knees and ooh and ah. Anyone know who this baby is? Yep, it's Hitler. I found a four-year-old picture too. Go to the next slide. 
give you a little bit of help if you wanted to. There was an Anglican priest, I believe it was, who saved him from drowning when he was four and took this picture shortly thereafter. Very odd thing to think about. And the reason this picture became so popular, on the next slide, there's this uh, book that came out explaining Hitler by Ron Rosenbaum. And it's the picture that really got everyone, right? You put a picture of baby Hitler and everyone kind of goes a little bit stir crazy. They look at that and they, they try, it, it, it's what this book is, it's a collection of all the various people who have tried to make sense of Hitler, try to explain Hitler, and this author sort of trying to weigh all these together. And he's not personally trying to explain Hitler, but for him it's interesting to pull all of these together. And some people have been horrified by this, because if you try to explain evil, if you try to explain how did that cute looking kid become Hitler, there's this sense that somehow you're trying to explain away and maybe sympathize and empathize with him and uh, a lot of makes a lot of people really nervous. But this is what we see in Revelation. In the middle of the seven trumpets of Revelation, the second set of seven, we have the seven trumpets of Revelation. What we see is the appearance of these locusts. These locusts that bring these horrible hard times and these locusts are described and they are horrifying. They have tails like scorpions and in their tails is the power to harm people for five months. Why five months? Well that's how long locusts live. There's, there's no actual deeper meaning there. There's no symbol. Five months is actually just five months. But they have tails like scorpions. They have scales like iron breastplates. The noise of their wings is like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle, and the most horrifying part of it is that they have faces like humans. Right? These locusts are brought into the world. This is a symbolic representation of the evil that's happening to all of them, all of the Christians. And this evil has been brought into the world with a, they have the faces of humans. It is the human decisions that have brought this evil. It's the human invitation to evil, a human acceptance of evil that is causing such horror for those. And so to grapple with this, it, it's hard because we, we look at the face of baby Hitler and see that it was that human who made decisions to accept and invite evil that brought about one of the worst moments of horror in the 20th century. And in the first century, this is saying the same thing. That the horrible times that are coming, talking about these locusts and the way that people are suffering, how are brought into, brought into this world from the decisions to invite and accept evil by humans. Right? The decisions that hum humans make. Right? Yet this is never the end of the story. For the last of the seven trumpets blow, and we read that the seventh angel blew his trumpet, there was a loud voice in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And the God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. All right, so this, if you want to try to understand hard times, John is telling us the, the message of the seven trumpets of Revelation is that hard times, this evil comes because people make decisions to invite and accept evil into their lives. And, and, and that the evil will come to pass. There will be a new age that will come. God's kingdom will, will come. But hard times happen because humans make decisions to accept evil. Hard times, they're like predicting weather in northeast Missouri. Because, you know, every time we, you look at the weather map, right, and you look at the weather map, and, and it's like in the middle of January, and, and there'll be this prediction that in the next hour, there's going to be 17 feet of snow and 6 inches of freezing rain, and we're going to drop down to negative 20 degrees, and then it all just goes south of us, right? How often does that happen to us? It happens all the time. I'm exaggerating a bit, maybe not 17 feet of snow, but I remember being called out because the National Guard was going to meet us at the court courthouse and it was like oh my god the city of Milan will never survive whatever I mean, it, it's just, it happens to us again and again and again. It, it just it drives me crazy. I think it bothers my wife a lot more. But that is how Missouri weather works. right? You think in northern Missouri you think it's going to get us and then nothing. That is much like what we see in the seven bowls of God's wrath. Right? In the seven bowls of God's wrath, we hear that there's going to be a battle coming. 
Well, a battle in first century Rome is like having a wet, miserable, miserable February in northern Missouri. Well, duh. Of course Rome is going to have another battle. That's what they do. They built the biggest army that's probably ever existed, the Roman legions. Of course they're going to have another battle. Tell me something I don't know. Then we find out, it tells us that the enemy is coming from the east. Well, the enemy coming from the east in Rome is like our weather coming from the west. Where else would it come from? In the Roman Empire, they have conquered all of northern Africa. German barbarians are not organized. Britain is just, they're not even, they're not even up to anything yet. So there's really only one direction you can have problems from the east. And so to say that the Roman Empire is going to have a war and the problem is going to come from the east is obvious. That's where the Persian Empire was. That's where the Parthian Empire was at that point. Empire, they're always having battles from the east. And we find out, it says there in the seven bowls we're talking about, uh, it says that the battle is going to happen at the Har of Megiddo. The Har is valley, and Megiddo is uh, the choke point of trade in Israel that controls the all trade that goes north-south around the Mediterranean. And so if you want to control Israel, you fight at Megiddo. It's the best place to have a battle. There are bones buried centuries deep at Megiddo, at the Har of Megiddo, the valley of Megiddo. Har Megiddo, Har Megiddo, Armageddon, you hear how that translates, right? So to say that you're going to have a, the Roman Empire is going to fight f with someone from the east at Armageddon is obvious, right? That's not a surprise. The surprise that we read here is that in the midst of one more battle, we read that this disastrous battle doesn't happen. It doesn't happen because God acts, an earthquake shakes the land, hail falls from the sky, and the armies scatter. And Armageddon, the battle of Armageddon, never happens. It never actually happens. It's never mentioned again. And so hard times, John tells us, are not going to be worked out by military might, by having one more battle, one more conflict. Hard times are worked out by what God does, not by what we do with swords. That's what John shows us in the seven bowls of Revelation. What we have here in the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls are three sort of vignettes that John shows us to help us understand about hard times. In the seven seals, we have the four horsemen and we see the logic of how evil unfolds. In the seven trumpets, we see how evil enters through human invitation and acceptance. That's why the locusts have human faces. But by the end, the kingdom of God will come. With the seven bowls, we see that that yes, there will be another battle. There is always another battle to happen, but the end of hard times do not come because we fight another battle, but because God's will is done. This is not a chronology. To look at the seven seals, trumpets, and bowls is not to lay out a timeline. Put up the next slide. This is what it is. We have the introduction of letters to the church at the beginning of Revelation. And seals, trumpets, and bowls, they're all concurrent events. They're all, they're, John is using, saying, he's giving three different ways to understand hard times and persecution. He's not trying to lay out a timeline. He's just trying to help you understand. And he's going at it in three different ways. And so, the, and this is, the whole of the book of Revelation is not meant to be chronological, but especially this point, it's just not, there's not a timeline. And so what, we have these three short vignettes, these three short stories about what hard times look like for persecuted Christians, and the question you might be asking is, does this apply to us today? Well, not directly. It really doesn't. We are not being persecuted. This applies far more to those who are being actively persecuted. It applies to the Coptic Church. The Coptic uh, Church is a church of Christians in Egypt. The PT of Coptic is the same PT of Egypt. They, they are connected. They, it's weirdness of, trans, of translation is why they sound so different. But Coptic Christians are the Egyptian Christian church in the Middle East. It, they're between 6 and 11 million. They are the biggest group of Christians in the Middle East. And last February, 21 of their young men were abducted and were assassinated by ISIS on video. You might have heard about this. 21 young men from this village were all abducted. They'd gone to Libya to get work. And so now there are mothers, fathers, wives, and children who are coping with hard times. And this 
These are letters for them. This is letters for them. This is letters for them to read and for them to be able to understand that ISIS and those locusts, well, I think there's a direct comparison there. I'm saying that ISIS and the locusts, those horrible, ugly, evil locusts where they're singers of scorpions, and that, yes, that's what I think of when I'm reading about ISIS. For these are people who have made decisions to invite and accept evil into the world. And while they are still made in the image of God, they have done much to deface that image. All right? These people made in the image of God, it is, there is a chance that they might repent. And, and that is why we read in the seven trumpets, that part, it talks about we, we wait a time for people who still might repent. But this is news for them. The trumpets, the seals, and the bowls. I read this morning, I, I had this all prepared, the whole sermon ready, and uh, I read this morning that there were two bombs set off last night in Lahore, Pakistan. Two bombs were set off in front of two churches, and last night, 14 Christians, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, died walking out of worship. 80 more were wounded by terrorists, Islamic terrorists of that region. I mean, this, these are not words for us. These are words for them, for them to hear and find something to hold on to during their hard times. I don't want you to read the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls of Revelation and be afraid. For after all, this letter, I, I say this every time I talk about Revelation, this letter is a letter of hope for persecuted Christians. It's a letter of good news for persecuted Christians. And it provides wisdom about how we understand hard times. But since we are not actually the Christians in hard times right now, I believe the best we can probably do with these chapters is to read them, to remember that they're there, pray for those for whom they pray for those Christians who are facing hard times, and if God forbid we ever find ourselves in persecution, remember that there is guidance waiting for us here if it comes to that. Amen.